introduce, uh, he goes by two names. You can call him Yang or you can call him Shao, and he'll answer to both, and he's never really answered which he prefers. <laughs> And so I call him Shao because that's what he told me to call him when he arrived in Canada in 1989 or something? Or 88. 88. And, um, but then he went, finally ended up in the U.S. and nobody asked him what, what they, he wanted to be called. So they just started calling him Yang. And that's true, right? They did that's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you probably all read the blurb that uh, Shao call him that. Um, he, he was, he's going to talk about his work in patient safety research, but if, in my opinion, he's one of the pioneers in this area, the area of human factors, people looking at patient safety, looking at uh, more than just equipment, but looking actual cognitive engineering in the clinic. In particular, he did his, I'll call it a seminal research on looking at the expertise of anesthesiologists. Um, nobody else was doing that at the time. I think he's one of the first. And as a result of that, once he finished um, with an excellent thesis, which I mentioned to you, I actually presented to my grad class, uh, my other grad class a few weeks ago. Um, he was snapped up by the University of Maryland, where he was arguably, or Maybe there's no dispute about this. The first engineer who got an academic appointment in an anesthesiology department, the faculty of medicine, and became what year was that? Well, he was. It was 1994. As I he was eventually in the became. He eventually became a full professor there before moving to where he is now, because the challenges of just being a professor were a passe. Right? <laughs> so uh, now he's doing real stuff. At, at Baylor Medical Center, that's not really what it's called, but you know what I mean, in, uh, in Dallas. Mark said I could tell only one anecdote about when he was a yeah, grad one student. Anecdote, yes. Only one anecdote. So um, I noticed on his, uh, on the resume that was published that he's taking flying lessons. And so what springs to my mind is the time I got a panicked phone call when he was learning how to drive that he had just backed up his car through the front window of a barber shop on Bathurst Street. And what did he do? So I hope you don't get any analogous phone calls because of your pilot license. <laughs> 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 it's safe. It is true. That's the end of my anecdote. So he's going to talk. I think at some point we're going to get interrupted by tea and coffee and use your judgment about standing up and helping yourself or it'll get cold if we wait till the end. So maybe it won't come and it won't be an issue. Okay, go. I kept within my limits? Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Paul. That's a very uh, generous uh, introduction. And the story is true that I back into a barber shop. I uh, passed the other day, yesterday, in front of the barber shop and it's well and still got customers in there. <laughs> uh, so the world is a very resilient world. Um, so what I'd like to talk today is, um, uh, since most of you, um, I know the people really care about is actually here, so really good. I want to invite especially the young people that to, um, how we can improve patient safety with the insights uh, you may have that's different than, say, people who have not been trained in human factors. So um, clearly I do not have many answers, but I'd like to, as a way to encourage you to think about it. So uh, how many of you have uh, heard the term surgeon's caddy? You heard the golf has a caddy? You have? Excellent, anybody else? No? So why golf, golfer need a caddy? Whole stuff for, for the for the okay. So we can focus on the game. Focus on the game, excellent. So if a surgeon did not have a scrub tech, the surgeon would be digging in the instrument and all that. And that was uh, more than hundred years ago. Um, it happens that uh, there's a comment that med med medicine is a hundred years behind 
the rest of the world. So uh, in a few weeks ago, New England Journal of Medicine has an article celebrating uh, Gilbert's original filming of surgeon's removal of a tumor and realize it's better off for the surgeon to have a caddy. No, we don't call them caddy, we call them scrub nurse to help the surgeon to, to work. Uh, if you Google time motion and Gilbreth and New England Journal of Medicine, you will actually see the video, so, which is pretty amazing. Think about the field that something happened 100 years ago, now um, celebrated in, in the premier, a premier journal of uh, medicine. So um, maybe one of you would do something in 100 a year or show up in one of those journals that uh, inspire the future. That really changed. So in operating rooms, I cannot imagine any ORs I went to that did not have a, a scrub nurse. So it's truly uh, innovation. So it's not emphasized on training the surgeon how to do certain things, but invent how things are done completely. So that's really uh, very inspiring to me anyway when I saw that example. So can we do something? Uh, maybe approaching that level of impact. So that'll be something that we can all look forward to. So hopefully at the end you have some answers to how to achieve that. Uh, so I have to have a few slides. I want to show a few things here. Uh, oops. There we go. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I just make sure that I um, accessed it this morning in here, and that was the uh, article, if you want to care to read. It's very easy to read article and describe how uh, a non physician come to have such an impact. Uh, in healthcare. I don't know how many hours or how many patients this intervention uh, has saved. So um, if you click on this, you will get a video. You can actually watch a silent movie. Uh, this is uh, the age where there's no audio in the recording part. You get to see a little bit of, of the, the activities. And I still don't know how many we actually do in, these, in the hospital to, to have this level of under understanding. So another piece of a story of, uh, of uh, healthcare I'd like to see highlight. Uh, this is not because Professor Sanders is my academic grandfather, but um, there is an eight-page article um, he wrote. So easy to read. The problem with that eight pages is that every word is a word, so you cannot skip, okay, this paragraph is nothing, so you've got to read carefully. So I'm going to read just one sentence. It says, it is a folk myth that people who make errors are careless or stupid or idiots or fools. This is 1991. And so um, I joined uh, a, a healthcare system eight years ago. Um, that's still something that, that we um, try, to imp try to implement. When something happened, we we'll analyze the starting point is not to find out who did not follow the procedure because that person did not understand the procedure. So that's still a challenge, even today. Even that, we know this is the best approach. So I'm going to stop this video. You can watch when you go back. So in the hospital, uh, when we improve, one thing we want to measure, um, anyone heard the term healthcare acquired conditions? Someone in the back heard? Great. So uh, they work on so-called patient safety movement and has tried to reach the point where something is measurable. So uh, the managers will say, I cannot manage, manage anything that's not measured. So uh, it started maybe four or five years ago. So each hospital has to measure in, uh, in the United States, I think in Canada too, uh, how many Acquired conditions. It's a very nice name, acquired conditions. So what will be acquired conditions? If you go to the hospital, um, you fell and you fracture your bone, that's acquired condition because you went in without that. 
Um, if you go into hospital and uh, uh, someone left behind a surgical instrument, uh, that's a quiet condition. Or your wound is infected after surgery, uh, that's in a quiet condition. So hospitals are required to report them. And then there's a score for you. And then the government, uh, since uh, the uh, care of 65 or older uh, is basically paid by the government. So the government would uh, withhold 1% of the payment. So a hospital may have 4% margin, which is reasonable to expect. Imagine that 1% is withheld and would not pay for the hospital's uh, bill. In other words, we only pay only 99% of the bill you generated because there are too many healthcare quiet conditions. So that has really changed a lot of discussions in hospitals because now we talk about money, not that I have a moral obligation to deliver health care. So um, in other words, it would be a lot easier for you to go to hospitals nowadays, say I want to improve health uh, safety, and you will get more sympathetic years to say, well, yeah, we want to do that because we want to get our bill paid. And that's a big impact, this, uh, I say. Even though it has this deficit, but it's, uh, it is pretty uh, remarkable. Uh, what I want to show you, the, since the, um, some of you are interested in design, I was told to tell a little bit about the design. I will show you uh, some visuals here. I think that's big enough. Um, so on the left is a um, somewhat sterilized a stylized uh, fridge for baby milk. So for, as we all know, it's very important for uh, especially premature born uh, babies to have milk from the mother. Um, but the way in some, in some circumstances is actually done through so-called expressed milk. In other words, the mom would uh, use a pump or some other method and uh, maybe fortified with uh, supplements into milk and put it into these um, syringes or bottles, and then later on you feed babies. Um, so if you want to take a picture of a perfect neonatal uh, in intensive care unit, you will get a picture on the left. If you go to, I don't know, I have not been to, I have not been to a NICU here, but if you go to one of our hospitals, I mean some of them you will have something on the right. Uh, so once in, a, once in a while, a baby would re receive a milk from not her mother, but from uh, another mom, a mom. So we call it a, a misadministration. It's an error. Uh, we think they're all, all preventable. So when the first time we, do, we did a root cause analysis, and we're in the conference room, I said, let's take a look at your Nickel baby, uh, nickel place, and then it says, "Okay, so where do you want to look?" I said, "Where the milk uh, is stored." And I opened the fridge. I said, "Well, that didn't look, look like a place where you try to prevent errors." So, I'll give you a little bit of uh, background. So, the Ziploc bags um, uh, can—they don't seal very well, in, especially when it's cold, rigid. So, in your fridge, you probably have your have that experience. Sometimes we open. And there's no certain levels where how many bottles you know you will have for a baby. So for some babies, they maybe have, you have 30, 50 bottles. And so you, the NICU would say, gave more, gave more, and did not have a way to say to the mother, we don't need any more. And the white tab that the, uh, were to block the names on these uh, trays, they're not there. So in other words, when you open, it's not, um, doesn't have these nice labels. And imagine someone take a bottle out, use it, and return by accident to a different bag. And when the next person will pick up the bottle, what's the chance of that bottle get detected? Probably very low. And so that, um, one thing that um, when we think about solutions is uh, what about we do a barcode medication? So this is actually a pattern. Um, uh, it's one of the nicer drawings in, in pattern diagrams. So they, 
it has the idea where if you barcode the medication, sorry, in this case, the, the baby's milk, and then you barcode the baby, and the computer in theory should tell, well, this is the wrong uh, milk you gave to the baby. So if you use one of the system like this, that we should not have any errors. Uh, so, now of course, we do have problems. The question is how? Uh, and so we got invited into another root cause analysis, and they have this one of this fancy barcode system. And the question, why? Why would that still happen? So we talked to them. They had the system on the left. It says you uh, first have a barcode system to tell you um, if the baby has the right milk. Um, then the computer would tell you you have to have a manual double check. In other words, another nurse would come in to sign on the computer and says, OK, I look at the baby's uh, band. I look at the, the bottle. The names match. The expiration date's OK. Everything matches. And after you sign in that, and you would administer. And that is supposedly safer than the system where you would eliminate the manual double check. In other words, if you, bark, if you scan it, you would uh, uh, administer immediately. You do not have the human to administer. And when I talked to the, the designer of the whole flow, they said, yeah, this is, has to be safer if you have a duplicate automatic and manual checking of the identification and the baby's milk. Then when you talk to the nurses, they say, well, when I, if I scan on, on the computer, I cannot proceed anymore with my system unless someone come here to confirm manually. And in the NICU, uh, they feed baby four times a shift. Uh, each nurse may take care of four nurses, so it'll be 16 feet each shift. And when you are feeding your baby, your fellow nurse is also feeding their babies. And where would you find them to have time to double check your work? So instead of having that double checking, so they say, well, I cannot use the automatic checking because if I do use that, I have to find a nurse. So the workaround, anyone can give a guess what would be the workaround? Go ahead. They double check themselves. Double check themselves. You have it. Don't use it. So what they do is uh, they would uh, <coughs> give the baby at the end of the shift. Then they would find the monitor have the sticker, that's the milk label, and a sticker for baby's uh, identification band. They call the nurse over. They band and scan at the end of the shift. When all this is all done, scan it. And the nurse signed it off. And with all four uh, milk feedings for that whole shift, walk to the next baby and duplicate the same process. And so you can imagine someone even optimize this process even better, have all the, the labels together in one location, get the whole thing over completely. Um, so if you think about it, we designed a fantastic electronic system, a very expensive, difficult to deploy. People have to get trained on them. And someone said, well, this is, we're talking about uh, bodily fluid. We have to have another manual check. Guess what happens when you have that solution? You have none of the benefits of the both. So we spend the money. We did not benefit anything. We continue to have this uh, root cause analysis of why this happened. So the, um, we had to go out to find the literature to, to demonstrate if you remove the step, it's safer. So I'm going to show you uh, another set of examples. Come on. There we go. OK, here's another example of something about design. Um, so one of the things you try to prevent is if patient is on the operating room table, and you should prevent the patient from falling out of the table, right? So that's one thing. If you, if you can do something right in the, oper in the operation, that's one thing you need to do right. Patients should not fall out of the operating room table. 
But when they do, of course, the question is, how is that possible? Right? So immediately we have, have a case of uh, so-called root cause analysis. And so we, um, again, got involved and then uh, to see how is that possible. So we get this bed set up. And someone forgot to put this pin in where the whole bed is uh, locked onto the pivoting point of the bed. So if you don't have the tipping, the bed would fall. But notice it did not uh, fall at the first sight, right? It, it stayed there. But once in a while, if you do it just right, uh, like in this case, and so you remove the pin, tipping, um, and you try to uh, shake the bed off the table, it did not fail. So what do you think, how, where's the problem for this bed design? So you can imagine sometimes you have the whole case, this locking pin is not in place. You didn't even know that. And some other time you would have the, the problem. So we take some pictures of the bed. If you have the bed, this is one of those beds where you want to flip the patient around during the case, from prone to, uh, to supine position. So for example, for a spine case, you put the patient upside down during the case. So this bed will allow you to do that. So you would have to secure the patient from bottom and top. And it has all the pins in place, you see these pins in place. And without that, that pin should fall. But sometimes, as you saw, it didn't. Um, so if you search the adverse event reporting system run by FDA, and you have lots of reports. In fact, the company decided to recall the bed, so no more use this bed unless you sign a legal release to say, if something happened to your patients, do not sue us because you said you will take the risk. So this is when the bed has that TP in place. And this one, can you tell it is not in place? So this one's in. This is in. And this one, that's missing. So when I look at the design, you got this uh, doll, very certain doll, very deep. When you put it in the hole, remember they're in the four corners of the bed, you have to line up perfectly to have it fall. If you have any twist, it will bind the doll. But during the case, how can you be sure of that? So our lawyers said, well, do we want to sign this form or not? And the surgeon says, absolutely, because I cannot operate without this bed. And the risk management lawyer says, Wait a minute, what happens when we sign and patient actually fall? What can we do to eliminate the risk? Okay, the manufacturer said, let me send you a notice. So the hospital, this hospital decided to print them out, put, a, put in a plastic envelope, tie it to the bed, highlighter to say, this is important, you need to read this stuff. It's five pages to tell you a uh, patient may fall from this bed. So clearly, we can do better than this. Um, so we talked to one of the uh, owners. She said that we have a way to dip the handle uh, into a paint that uh, still can sterilize the, 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 the metal, but the paint would stay, would make it easier for you to detect. So um, that's one solution uh, they came up with. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, uh, it did not eliminate it, at least give a better visual cue of it. Okay, so um, I have probably another 30 minutes-ish, um, so I will describe, um, just try to imagine your, um, your mother, if you're, or your grandmother, if you're young. <laughs> so, uh, has a COPD, the, the, uh, has a lung obstructive disease, cannot breathe very well, and all of a sudden called 911 and end up in hospital. Uh, the first thing 
the hospital would do is to, to ask the family um, what medications the patient is on. Uh, the family would say, oh, I have no idea. Maybe here's some bottles gave to, uh, to the, the doctors. They will register in, in the computer. And then the physicians in the hospital would uh, prescribe new medications. Um, it's not a feature, right? So, if, so what are you allergic for? The family would say, okay, um, my grandma is allergic to penicillin. And so the nurse will put it in. The doctor would uh, prescribe a antibiotics if a pneumonia. And let's say it is another uh, penicillin. Wouldn't be great for the computer to, computer to say, well, look, the patient is allergic to penicillin. You're giving the patient a, a penicillin. And that should alert fire in the screen to tell, alert the physician. And that is one of the conditions um, to have something called the compu uh, computerized order entry system. Um, so when physician enter the order of penicillin, in behind the scene, there's a rule that says, OK, well, the patient cannot get, receive this. So um, uh, there's a rating system of hospital patient safety. One of the conditions is patient uh, hospital use one of the systems. What could go wrong with that system? Any suggestions? If the patient doesn't know what they're taking. So therefore, maybe they don't even know. Yeah. OK. Any suggestion from you? Okay, yeah. What's your suggestion? Sorry? A tablet in American incorrectly, yeah. So um, those are great answers. That that's actually one of many of the, the, the problems with this uh, system. So patient may not have an allergic reaction to medicine. In fact, they did a study, less than 5% of the patients who said they're allergic to penicillin. Not really. Um, that's sort of a, so a lot of physicians know that. When something show up, they blow through, so well, I'm not sure about this. There are many other alerts. In fact, uh, there's one study to show more than five to 10 alerts per order in session for a patient. So imagine just going through that process. So there's one study at the end, the conclusion, if you read the abstract, it will say the biggest the challenge is for our users to actually comply to what our computer system said. Sounds like a human factors problem, right? So you got an alert, but either people do not uh, respond to the alert appropriately after the fact, or ignore the alerts completely, or somehow block it. Um, the, there's even study to show if you reduce the amount of alert, there's no reduction of adverse drug events. So in fact, we don't even have a proof the system actually work. Um, so let's say now, okay, so your grandma is in the hospital and, uh, and the nurses start to use computer to document. And from a system po system's point of view, um, quite often we try to look for usability issues. So the first time I was called to say, we got a problem with usability, I got so excited, so I learned all these techniques of uh, usability, now I get time to use it. And it turned out, uh, this is one of the problems we had, so in one unit. So you got the computer screen installed in a nursing, in a patient room behind a couch. So this is the patient's bed. Here's the tray, and here's the couch that family can stay with pillows. So overnight, the family can sleep here with, um, like you are the caregiver, and your grandma lying on the bed, and nurse come here, want to use that computer. What do you think the, 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 the outcome of that? Well, that computer will not get used. And that's not a cheap installation. That one probably costs, I would say, $2,000 just to put the thing in there. And we all talk about cost consci uh, conscious. That's $2,000 to demonstrate how uh, inept of the hospital is. The nurse will say, you want to save money? Look how you waste the money, right? So that's a very brutal demonstration of the problem. And it turned out that we look at the uh, usability issue, and one of the things we realize is that we often have 
especially when I was in training, not no, no offense, Paul, is looking somewhat a limited view of a system, a human, a computer. Um, we try to, many people still do to this day, to point fingers at the vendor to say, this Epic, this Auscript, they design a very bad system for us. In many cases, they're true. But quite often, when we analyze all the problems, they're not just the designer that's our own in each hospital has its own problem. How do you deal with response time and, and, and downtime? You know, the computers somehow stop working, the servers uh, is down or with a uh, whatever interface problem or power outage. And there's also issue with training. These systems are so complex, there's no way for you to train to remember. And someone said, well, how about we design a system that does not require training? Um, probably very difficult because there's a lot of things, the, the legal requirement, the, um, uh, the policy procedures, they are very complex. They're not straightforward where everything is on the screen. But certainly we can do more of that. And there's also the there's ongoing system tem tempering. So the hospital always bring new stuff to it. Today is barcode medication administration. Tomorrow maybe is a new alert. A day after maybe interface with a patient vital science type. So we, we, if we limit us to only the human and a computer screen, you optimize what's on the screen. You have the perfect design, except that screen is behind a couch. So you, you have your effort wasted. So. Okay, let's see your grandma's uh, recovered and uh, very nicely. Uh, one of the problems is uh, you got one nurse taking care of six patients. And the nurse cannot work around all the time. So one thing technology can help is uh, have alert, right? So um, in this case, let's say over sedation, you want to prevent too much opioids going to uh, grandma on top of uh, sleeping pills and other stuff that patient, the patient may receive. Um, this is a sort of a classic human factors problem where if you optimize the performance of, a, of alarm, which means that you try to make it really sensitive, um, what ends up happening is overall the whole system, the nurse plus the alert, may be less optimized because the nurse now decide not to respond at all. So in our system, we purchase a whole bunch of monitors where uh, each time when patients um, uh, satu oxygen saturation drops a certain level, they say 89%, and nurses wear a pager, pager will go off. Uh, about 60% of the time, the alarms are totally meaningless. So a nurse on a, on a given shift could receive 20, 30 pages and over time, one day uh, we walked into one unit and asked to see where are the pagers because they don't wear them. It turned out in a very nice rubber band, 10 of them for all nurse nurses in a drawer. And they have not been used for the last few months. So the battery all went bit dead and all that. And because the whole system was designed in such a way, um, we buy one system and we think it is going to be good enough for uh, the patient without thinking of how to put together in, in Indigo to achieve safety. So here's one flow chart. Uh, this is actually not very clear, but alarm will send it to best at nurse and wait for a while. And if the patient, sorry, the best at nurse did not respond, the charge nurse now taking care of maybe five other nurses and her page is gonna go off so quickly, the battery will drain in one shift. Uh, so the charge nurse would have to decide that. Um, OK, show you another uh, technology that uh, uh, was not well integrated. And I found this picture. Um, it's a little bit bigger. This is the most I can actually see. Uh, so all the, each one is an infusion pump. Try to infuse something to the baby. Um, what is the chance? Of, this is a manually programmed pump where you say, what's the rate you want to, the, the, the fluid to go in, and how fast you want the fluid by, like say, a uh, milliliter uh, per hour or per minute. 
and for how long or how many meals you want to give to the, the baby. And you program this. What is, the what is the chance of they all program correctly every day? OK, so we know there's certain error we commit. Uh, so this, we have a chance to get it wrong. Now, what is a technology solution? So I have another one that's um, another drawing of a, a patent that basically uh, take the, what's infused by the pump and what's the medication going to the patient, then compare to a safe limit of that, med that medicine can go to, into a patient. Say, for example, if, uh, uh, if you give a patient uh, vasopressin, you program as a three unit uh, per, uh, per minute, and that's too high, and the computer knows that since they have a library to look up to say, okay, for vasopressin, the highest you can go give is 0.1 unit per minute. You are giving me three units, that's too high. And the pump will stop and says, please re-enter. So when you analyze the log, sometimes you get these logs. This is the first attempt. This is actually later on found out the problem, edit. So clearly this is like 100 dose error, right? So if you multiply that by how many times occur, we can imagine this is probably a big cause for patient harm. Same thing for this drug. So I can imagine someone try to enter 2.5. Since the decimal point already is very close to zero, someone pushed the wrong button. And so that get into instead of 2.5 into 205. So the drug library uh, would compare what's the safe limit. And when it's beyond that, would we'll, we'll alert stop. Great concept, right? So if you deploy, what will happen? Do we, so each one of these pumps, the smart feature, costs about $3,000 per pump. So our system have probably 3,000 3, pumps. That's a lot of money to pay. And the proponent, the vendors, never came back to say, hey, you have been using our pump for five years, and let's see how, how many patients uh, you saved with our technology. They don't never do that. They just say, we sold you this $10 million equipment. That's it. Hope it goes well. Um, that, that happens a lot. We justify many things, a lot of things, the big ticket items we do not justify. So um, we believe the salesman's pitch. We buy them. We put it in place. Hope for the best. So this is sort of a nicer story because at the beginning, only about 39%, so this is the, we call it compliance rate. In other words, how often people actually use that feature to put in the drug name so the so-called smart pump would know what drug is infused because pump did not know what uh, drug patient is receiving. Um, so the, 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 you put in that, you put how much you want to go give the patient the library, the computer would compare, OK, for this drug, here's the limit. And because the usability is a design problem, only about 40% of the time, nurses will do that. Rest of the time, why do we even pick a drug? I just gave this, I want to infuse 100 mil per hour and push a button and go. Well, I don't have to select which drug the patient is uh, receiving. And it is clearly one technology that can see can save life, but um, buying the technology it, uh, it, is, is, a, is a barrier, but uh, it did not guarantee actually get used. So we use a term that there's a saying in uh, medicine that says, uh, drugs do not work in people who do not use them. Use them. Make sense? So here's the safety features do not work <laughs> for those uh, users that do not use them. So here we uh, 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 conduct a lot of the um, observation to figure out what could prevent a nurse from using it. And over time, this is uh, 2013. The last time we plot this one is 2015. Increased from 39% usage to 88% usage. So that's a dramatic increase. That means that uh, a lot of people have to believe in this thing would save their patients uh, from, from, har from being harmed. And we also monitor the uh, number of so-called uh, catches or saves. In other words, remember that 2.5 entered as 205. 
remember early on? Each one is recorded by in, in the data logs. We analyze how often that was happened. So by increasing the compliance, more of those errors were caught, which is good, right? So you, you anticipate that. Same time, we change the limit so that reduce the number of false alarms. So the, the number of alerts also reduce over time. So from uh, that's this, this curve gradually reduced. So we got the best of both worlds. So you, you use more often, is more effective. At the same time, fewer uh, alerts generated because we remove some of the alerts that do not make sense. Say, for example, the um, for IV fluid, if you infuse too fast, uh, then can potentially blow the uh, IV lines. But that's different kind of risk than a drug that's 10 times overdose. So we reduce some of the, the, the alerts that we think they do not really benefit that much from, um, from a safety feature. OK, now I'm going to describe a little bit of the, the current project we did. So um, let me close the screen a little bit. Um, so let's suppose your grandma survived the hospital, so, uh, pneumonia is under control, and the hospital prescribed some antibiotics to continue the treatment to go home and uh, also activate all the sleeping pills or um, uh, stool softeners, whatever that gave to the patient to go home. Um, what are the chances chance that the grandma takes all the medication correctly at home? <laughs> so the, uh, uh, so we apply for grant funding and uh, funded by uh, uh, the government. And first in, in, a, in a kickoff meeting, uh, I don't know, we did not know how it happened. Someone asked, can you define what is medication safety? So we said, oh, well, that's easy. Uh, let's ask around. So we asked the uh, hospitalists, the physicians. So can you define what's medication safety when patient goes home? And the doctor, one doctor would say, oh, that's easy. Uh, the patient should take all the medications prescribed. Right? So the patient had four days of antibiotics in the hospital, should continue another, let's say, three days of treatment of antibiotics uh, at home. So patients should pick up the, the prescription on discharge and continue for three days. That's the definition of medication safety for the, med for the uh, uh, hospitalists. So that sounds fair. So we talk to a pharmacist. So what do you think of the medication safety? What is medication safety when patient is discharged home? Oh, that's easy. If the doctor's prescribed correctly, <laughs> that is the, <laughs> that is the uh, uh, definition. If you look at the statistics reporting by different journals, that's how to show up. So for if the, if the journal is, is by uh, primarily for uh, physicians, the measurements is so-called medication adherence. Did you take the meds? I told you you should be taking. If you st look at the pharmacy journal, it will say medication appropriateness. Did we give this patient the right uh, medication? So we had listened to that. That's funny. That's interesting. But nobody has asked patient. What does it mean to be medication safety? Anyone want to give a, give a guess what they, they would say? Or some of you probably even have personal experience. What would you say? What would be the medication safety for your grandma, for your mother, or for your loved ones? What would you say? Too many pills because it's too complicated. Too many pills, too complicated. Excellent. That's a great answer. Uh, but if you look at the studies, that's, I think they touch a little bit, but not a whole lot. We give you 35 pills. That's one patient we in, uh, interviewed. That patient's supposed to take all 35 medications. So that's not safe you, from your point of view. Any other answers, you think? Well, shall uh, John solve this? He takes Brazilian pills. <laughs> and so he was getting confused. So we got a, a, a card, and we got some glue. And we stuck <laughs> an, a sample of each pill. Yeah. Yeah. And then we wrote the name of the medication and how many times when you take it. Yeah. And then we put it in a, you know, a 
procedural envelope so that uh, as a reference if he doesn't yes yeah as a reference yeah but i came out of hospital not so long ago uh, after major surgery and uh, i picked up all these pills and also self injecting nonsense and god knows what and i had so much morphine when i got home i couldn't possibly have monitored have done the pills right. myself i was in a total fog yeah. so we paid somebody thank you canada and it doesn't cover all that <laughs> and neither does green shield usc um, to to do this and tell me okay here you take these now and you and they kept the record then when i came out of the fog of morphine i kept a journal actually and even at night i i would scribble it yeah in the middle of the night so in the morning i could at least know what did i take because i'd written something yeah so your safety would say someone should uh, looked after you for that period instead of relying on yourself? Well, if, you, if, if the person is under heavy right. medication, they can't possibly do Right. That. Another one is to have, to make sure you have a system to, yeah. to manage it. Yeah, we should have shown you that last night. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. And you send me a photograph of that. So transparent services often use that too, because the transparent uh, patients have more complex regimen. Um, so some patients will say uh, side effect. You know, that's not safe. Another one would say, um, ineffective. The doctor gave me this drug, it didn't do anything. Um, that, I don't like that part, so that cannot be safe. Another patient says, it's costing too much. I'm not sure it is a huge concern uh, with a single payer system, but that's one problem is that patient uh, will try to decide to have a food or my pin pills versus the antibiotics the grandma just had that need to have three days of supply. Not understanding what the medication is for, that's another concern that patient has. So you can see that even for a simple concept, what is safety, what, what do we try to optimize is different if you talk to different people. Yet when we talk about patient safe, safety, when we send this proposal in, one of our colleagues says, hey, you study something we know all along. Uh, and now I, th I don't think he's saying that anymore. So by the time he says, we know what's going on with patient going home. They don't follow my instruction. That's the problem. <laughs> so they don't take that into account where they cannot. Um, so we start also visiting patients home to see how exactly they do it. So in hospital, we have medication already in one place. Everybody got a list. You got one place and this, this control for the flow when that meds get to patient. Even with that system, we sometimes make mistakes. And when we go to, so far, five, six patients' home, not a single patient has one location for all the meds. They will have their natural cholesterol in the heart attack emergency pill next to their couch because that's the last, the worst moment to find, where's my emergency pill at that moment? You want ready in hand. Uh, they may have their um, inhalers in their pocket because they walk around, and when they cannot uh, breathe, they would use inhaler right off. And you're about four or five different places. And so some people say, well, what about, what about give them a pill box? So some of you probably are familiar with it. Yeah. So each visit, I ask patients, so can you show me if you have a pill box? And at each time, I went with a um, nurse practitioner, and she was amazed. I said, why you ask that question? And when patient answered, she was so totally dumbfounded. So give you an example. So one patient got out. It is on a Friday. You would imagine the pill column for Thursday will be out completely. Either completely filled or Thursday should be out. Or Wednesday should be out, right? This is like a Jeopardy game. You have you know, his box of what have you know, all over the place. I asked him, so how do you use the pill box? Oh, this is a great storage for me. I don't have to in the open individual boxes. I just open the, the lid, I find the pill I want, I take them. That's how they use that pill box. So totally defeat that purpose, it becomes storage. Yeah. Another patient only used the pill box for supplements, the, uh, the uh, vitamins, and is in, in the kitchen, rest of them in a, pas uh, in a plastic bas basket. And that's what the patient has. So, um, 
it's pretty amazing. So we, we try to understand all this process. In the meantime, you probably saw in TV all these in-home pill dispensers where automatic at time give you alerts to say, oh, you are due for this med because the reason for that invention is the conception. The problem with medication safety is adherence. That whole solution was designed for that purpose. Spend a whole, whole lot of money to dispense pills. When patient has these medications, they're not in pills, or sometimes not in pills. Could be a patch, could be an eye drop, uh, could be a, a liquid form and uh, they have to take. So they're all in different places. There's not a single pharmacy um, in, in patients' home. This is in beyond that, some other complicating factors in the family. So that's really uh, eye-opening. So we uh, look at them in a pill box and look at the, how they keep calendars. Um, then it dawned us in terms of the education. So in, in healthcare, we, the, one of the buzzwords is precision medicine. So some of you probably heard this term. Uh, it's pretty, pretty nifty because the point is not personalized medicine because it is precisely for you. Great term. Guess what happened when we discharge patients, how precise we are. We have a standardized uh, packet, maybe 30 page packet, maybe more. So it depends on how many conditions patient has. Staple all together, put in one binder. It's common for everyone. So in one patient we look at, patient is not a smoker and still have a page on the importance of uh, you should st stop smoking because that's part of a standardized uh, treatment. So on one side we want to do genes, we want to do all the precision medicine. On the other high side, we don't bother to ask patient or to tailorize your interaction with patient. One standardized, one packet gave to patient. So um, that's uh, one thing that we have found out that each patient has a, their own system, how to manage the medication safely. But we, as a rule, we do not ask that. Here's your discharge instruction. Here's the meds you should take at home. In fact, in our instruction, in our system, on top of the line, we say, do not take any meds not on this list. And then there's a bracket, do not throw away any meds either. So it's just, in other words, um, about, uh, depend on study, you're at about 80 to 100% of the time, the list we gave to patients after discharge is, is not accurate. So in other words, almost always incorrect, the list we gave to patients. And that can be wrong in many reasons. One, um, patient could not remember, right? Patient has medication all over the place in the house. You ask patient what meds you are on, and we're talking about a recall test of a, of a patient who is uh, may not be that uh, alert. So what about what about what about give patient a list for them to write it down? Well, medication changes. So who is going to update that list? So another reason could be um, patients prescribe medication, but patients never use it. So. We went to um, a, a high altitude place and we take some Diamox, one of those medications you take when you go to a high altitude. So next time when I went to my primary care doc and she's going through a medication, are oh, you still taking Diamox? You know, that's sort of the things that in the list, that's totally in, in, incorrect. So I'm not sure you have you, go back to check your medication record kept by your physicians to see how many meds on it are actually uh, correct. So there's many reasons that's incorrect. Yet at the same time, we build safety for patients on the two, two assumptions. One, the list is correct. Second, you will follow the instruction to take this list. And those are totally both unnecessary to be safe, I think, uh, because many patients get along very well without these two, two systems, and not sufficient. We know that uh, about uh, a quarter of, uh, of the patients who went home will have some type of medication issues when they go home. So there's a lot of opportunities to develop a solution to how to engage patients, how to empower the patient to uh, build a system we call patient home team. So we can build a patient safety, home, uh, patient safety at patient's home. So how patient can design a system that could be a, a laminated uh, drug pill lookup table, <laughs> and it could be a diary. Um, we ask patients to show us what they, do they use for keeping themselves safe. So it has been very uh, 
uh, humbling for us anyway. So our team has doctors, nurses, and they beginning of the project, oh, we knew exactly what's wrong. So that has been studied for decades, and you cannot possibly find anything new. So uh, clearly, that's not the case. I think I'll stop here and uh, see if you have any comments to share uh, or a critique. Yeah, go ahead. I think we have heard many issues in the healthcare system. So, in your opinion, what's the most challenging issues or you know, factors affecting these issues from management policy or the tools, technologies, and really the visibility is how people can better use tools, how the human resources, if uh -huh. we have enough doctors or nurses or caregivers, their training, yeah. right? And yeah. also the patient issues in terms of human limitation, capability. OK, well, this. So many, many, the design of the whole system. Yeah. So well, as a potential patient, we probably all potential patients, the last thing we want is to rely on the hospital to be perfect. So I think the, um, uh, if I were to want to spend money to time to write a proposal it would be how to um, help the patient to develop a system to be safe. So that's, that's the part where if I were to uh, write a proposal to, to work on. So clearly what you said is excellent uh, suggestions. Those are training, the purchasing of equipment, um, as showing the beginning, some of the methods were used 100 years ago. Uh, we're still not actually fully benefited from it. There's a lot of things we can improve. But at this day, if I were to spend time to work on, that would be something I think that would really have a huge impact. How hospital or any other brother, any, anyone else, to help the patient to be safer. So that to me, that's what I would use. But those are the areas suggested. Those are excellent, excellent areas to work on. And so that you talk about the, uh, from patient perspective, uh, you know, human factors, traditional user centered design approach. Right. right. So that's why I uh, promote interaction centered design approach. It means, you know, with the system itself, you know, including patient and the caregivers, and also the system itself, the hospital, the immune at home. And whenever the patient interacts with the, whatever the tool, how the caregivers interact with the tools they need for taking care of the patient, how the patient taking drugs, whatever the package, this type of package they give to them, or yeah. whatever the reminders at home. Then it uh, seems like you need to do more kind of uh, analysis in terms of the, the whatever the technique they use. Yeah. They you right. Know, Right. Those, those, right. So I think a lot of contribution can be made by looking at the problem and understand um, as a whole from their perspective. Exactly. So we cannot uh, impose on a solution onto a patient. You buy these pill boxes, that will solve your problem. So that's a lot of times we now automatically give a patient pill box and expect them to use it properly. So that's not, I don't think that's going to work. Yeah, but also I heard, uh, sorry for taking from my time, a, a key word here is personalized. Personalized solution right. to both the patient and caregiver. Right, right, exactly. We have a precision medicine, but we don't have a precision in terms of supporting the patients. So John, you have a comment? Well, I have a question uh, on which data exists. I don't think they have reached the hospital or the pharmacy. As an extremely old person, <laughs> I have a vast array of medications prescribed to me by my physician. Physicians probably have more than one. More than one, many, many, many. Yes. <laughs> Perhaps as many as 10. Yeah. Well, they're dead. These come in different shapes and different colors. Uh huh. But a very popular shape is circular, 
there is a thickness of about one-fifth to one-third of the diameter. Uh -huh. And it surprised me to discover that looking at the pill in isolation, I cannot determine whether it's the larger, the smaller, or the bigger of three pills, all of mm. them white. <laughs> yeah. So I have to take them out and actually physically line them up in order to be able to distinguish one from the other. Because this question of medication error is not limited to nurses, pharmacists, and prescribers. Yeah. But to patients who have to use the pill. Right. And it's extremely difficult to distinguish two pills of the same physical shape. Right. Disc, circular, thickness, uh, right. ratio. Yeah. Uh, there is only one triangular pill that I'm aware of. I have not seen a square. <laughs> I've seen one long cylindrical pill, yeah. which is absolutely identical. <laughs> the only one I've ever seen. Yeah. And it's green, and no other pill yeah. is shaped like this. Right. Green. Yeah. All very small, mind you. But what we need are basic psychophysical evidence on the absolute identification of diameter. Right, without having a comparison. Without comparison. Yeah. So that if a pill is on, uh, let's say, a table, then I would know what pill it is I have not taken. Yeah. Or what pill it is that I have taken in error. Right, right. And I have not been able to find an adequate body of experimentally collected data. The sort of thing one would have done in so uh, I think, Paul, you have a project proposal right here. <laughs> I think that it would be possible then, by looking at reasonable populations, to get some idea of the permissible sizes yeah. and shapes, which together yeah. would constitute absolute identifiability right. on the part of the patient, the nurse, the parent, yeah. the caregiver. Like names, you cannot arbitrarily name drugs anymore. You have to get approval for potential confusion with another drug. Nobody tells me anything. There's, there's no question of approval to shape. That's right. Only to name. To name. That's right. That would be the next step. The I like minute that. it leaves the container, it has no name. <laughs> <laughs> shape, color, size. Yeah. I like that. Those it has. Yeah. So what we need is a definition. The features. Absolutely discriminable shape, size, color when put into an array. Right, right. What do we really know? That would be a neat the study. Answer, we don't know anything. Yeah, that would be a neat study. Yes? I'm curious about the um, symptoms and the triggers that nurses interact with. Are they um, field tested in any way, or do they just arrive in the hospital and have to sort of be interacted right. Yeah. So there are a few ways uh, equipment can find its way to the hospital. One would be um, we always buy this device from this vendor. There's upgrade, we buy it. And in other way, no evaluation whatsoever. Um, a, a step from that would be to have three vendors come in, uh, put in a room like this, I invite nurses come in to take a test drive for whatever they can do. A vendor will be on the site to, to do a pitch. And there will be formal evaluation, nurse will fill it out and tab tabulate it out. And then we decide what equipment we cannot possibly use, which one we must have, then send to the finance department to, to figure out which one has a better deal. Um, it is difficult to, um, to do any realistic trial. Uh, some places use simulation um, uh, to try it out. And there's a large variety of conditions uh, equipment be used. So often these evaluations are so narrowed only to certain
type of units, not to everywhere should be used. Pediatric is a good example that often get ignored in the hospital. So um, I think it, uh, it takes professional organization to really voice um, uh, sort of raise the standard how we can evaluate these devices before we do all these root cause analysis and we should have this. Uh, but that has not been a standard. Often is uh, like you go buy a car, you never go there just, I'm going to walk in the lot and kick the tire which one I want to buy. You already study the information ahead. And these nurse or user evaluation, they come in with nothing in terms of about that device. The accident report rate about that one, how often that device has been involved in, say, a fatal accident, and very little information is provided on that. So those are key decisions that often we use as a consumer, but hospitals have not got into this. Um, like in the military, you have a system that I mean, can probably tell you a whole lot to have that kind of evaluation. In hospitals, uh, it's, it's difficult. And things can come, find a way into a hospital many ways. Uh, very little control over that, so far anyway. So that's a great suggestion in terms of uh, how to engage professional societies to set the threshold. We will not buy this unless we have done a good evaluation, providing information from evaluation to the front line so they can use it while doing any evaluation for their particular unit. So. Yeah, so if that probably, we probably have new decisions every few hours, and so that would probably be difficult. So what we have done is more of a uh, pot shot uh, strategy. We heard rumors someone's going to buy a whole bunch of uh, ventilators. All right, so and the critical care will say, okay, we need this one is really important. Let's make sure we do evaluation. So the so last evaluation we did is a glucometer because uh, that's a, something that uh, get used a lot, so that's, um, we, we did participate in some of the evaluation, so. But the answer is no, not systematically. Mm -hmm. well, what's this, can you tell us what the state of affairs is with respect to um, error reporting system for healthcare providers? The voluntary one? Well, tell us. Okay, so what's the. What's the general state of affairs? The, uh, and do you think that there's hope for error reporting system for patients that they can read? Somehow. Yes, there, there are a system for a patient, uh, patient can report. Um, there are so-called patient safety organizations. Patients can report the problems they had with devices, medications, or hospital care. Um, those so far have not generated any value um, in terms of impact on the care. Uh, most hospitals would have a so-called voluntary, uh, but that means I can, well, I can do it or I can opt not to do it. Um, those have been effective in generating the communication within the hospital about the risk that frontline uh, involved. But the problem is, there's a, one problem is the misconception where uh, just imagine all of a sudden you get an increase of reporting. Okay, so what does that mean? Does that mean we have more problems or our system was so good, everybody believe if, if you report someone's going to fix my problem, then you report more. And so it's harder to, as a measurement, people try to rely on as a measurement. Mm -hmm. um, so what we have done is we analyze themes within it to detect early, theme, early trend, then conduct actual observation and, and audit to see whether that indeed is the case. So. Um, it has been very useful, but it's very, it wastes a lot of time because a lot of times people report and nothing was done on them. And that is a, a big problem for it. So it's, it's a good point. I think it should be, should be carried out, but the value has not really uh, harnessed in a way. Sorry, let me get her give one point. In general, it's probably very little. In general, so in specific cases, uh, it influenced dramatically. So we, in one case, we tried to buy a different armband. We run an experiment, and uh, 
I think there's other contributing factors, but one of the things was the analysis recommendation from us. But there are also studies published that would demonstrate it's if you have four infusion pumps, we're talking infusion pumps, the evaluation would uh, recommend A and B, the hospital would consider C and D. So uh, they probably buy one of the worst uh, one after evaluation, so. Is there any selection process to be a surgeon, a physician, a nurse yeah. that involves perceptual capability? Uh -huh. When I want to get a license to drive a car, <laughs> I have to do visual acuity, auditory function, in one country in the world, reaction time. <laughs> Yeah. Because if people cannot read numbers quickly or have a need for twice as much illumination, right. then you don't really want them. Right. So the, um, I think the current selection, I think going very well, is the sort of uh, uh, team, the, the ability to function as, as part of a team. I think in some places already started with that. Um, in terms of capabilities, I think that probably I, I would imagine, since I'm not one of the, 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 the uh, nurse or physicians, the response is, well, we got a system that would weed out these weaklings already, so, so they're probably not to worry about that. But the, in terms of a personality to work with others, um, that has, I think, in the UK started the discussion. We had one physician who uh, killed two patients and and it's just he should not be even a surgeon, but he passed all the training gates, you know, as residents and as a fellow, become attending, and it, he could not possibly operate. He killed two patients. So um, how do you find out about it? For this particular case, in a, in a working hospital. Uh, well, in this case, uh, in the middle of the case, he asked for help. Another surgeon showed up and watched his his operating and grab the knife from him so you cannot operate. Yeah, so, and it's published so you can see, read on the on, on news, so that's, that's, that's the one error. The other part is often is when something bad happened. So a patient um, um, after delivery went home, something fell out, so we left behind. Patients, well, you know, what is this? So, um, so it, is, uh, it is pretty, um, uh, primitive, since there's so many other big things to count, the focus has not been on, well, we don't know, that's theoretical, maybe in five years we'll have one of those. In the meantime, we have fire, we have wrong size surgery, let's work on them, since often you find them quickly. So a patient may uh, had planned for one thing for valve uh, placement and came out, and after surgery, no, it did not have one of the uh, stent put in, so not the heart valve you wanted. So um, that's pretty obvious in that area. But has not, there's no systematic way to, to count them. So our uh, lawyers have pretty good system to, for each case, would categorize what would be the contributors. Uh, but it, the train is moving slowly to catch into that direction. People are getting smarter. About Yeah. This was a major, a major problem. People got killed, people got injured, vast values of money lost, costs were enormous. There was one ship, one carrier, which had an absolutely perfect record. And somebody once had the wit to go and say, what do you <laughs> Yeah, that the captain said, well, I have one rule. If you make an error and report it to me, uh -huh. you get a day surely yeah. <laughs> reward. Yeah. He said, nothing ever happened. Yeah, that's the, 
the spirit, I think, is in, 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 in one, at least one of our, our hospitals. We call it uh, uh, good catches. So you actually get rewarded for that if you um, uh, recognize the error and, uh, and the, uh, get to take a picture with our CEO. And I think probably maybe some day off, I think it's equivalent. Uh, it is catching on. It is catching on. So the, the, the concept thing is to have more learning organization in a sense. Yeah. Influential right. We have it here. Yeah. So the, there's an organization by the name of uh, the, I think I got it right this time, Institute for Safe Medication Practices. Um, I didn't know how it got started until yesterday. I learned from John that uh, uh, he was instrumental to get it started. It's very influential to that. It send newsletters about potential risks, since uh, medications are are probably one of the things that uh, every patient would, would have to use in the hospital. Um, so they provide a lot of uh, recommendations, suggestions. So even though we wish the world changed quickly, but that part is really, I often got forward of a notice from ISMP to say, okay, the, uh, one of them recently is, we should not be using Pound and Kalo the same time. Uh, that's a bad idea. Uh, so um, everybody knows it's a bad idea, but actions will come more prompt because now it's recommended by ISMP. You should not do that. So that's a uh, it's, it's great organization. So that's that's uh, I think John that I don't know how many lives uh, that work has saved, but clearly it's a lot. Maybe Michael Cohen can tell you a bit more about the yeah yeah that that's that's great uh, really. Make huge difference. Anyway, I think the time is up. It's supposed to end at five thirty, and the camera might end up run out of film. <laughs> the lights will go down. So thank you very much for. Uh,